These are some of the steepest kilometers of the entire bike race on the Puy de Dome. And it kind of sticks up out of the middle of nowhere and has, I think, two kilometers at 12%. The average is six, 7% for the, for the whole climb. It is incredibly, incredibly difficult. Welcome back to the Placeholder Podcast, everybody. I'm Kaylee Fretz. Joining me today to talk Tour de France. We're doing a big deep dive on the Tour de France route today. We're going to go stage by stage. We're going to talk about all the biggest, scariest stages. We're going to talk about the kind of unique way that it's going to make its way across France this year. And joining me to chat through that, Dane Cash. How are you, Dane? I'm doing good, Kaylee. How are you? I'm great. And it's not it's not your first time in the podcast, is it, Joe? Uh, on placeholders, oh. I think, other than the, the quick interview is. I did with you and Wade pre-launch. That's right. Uh, well, Joe, well, you came over to my kitchen and we recorded that's a little right. segment as that's well. That's right. I forgot but, all. Yeah, that I, was a little stand out, out. standalone segment. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, for everybody out there who only listens to our podcast, you may not be familiar with Joe Lindsay, but Joe is an integral part of the Escape Collective. Uh, I'm gonna maybe the. From, Biggest story people would have read from you recently was a pretty in-depth investigation into the Zaf issue, which is what you guys were talking about at your on your kitchen table. Uh, yeah, Joe's going to join for today's episode as we talk through the tour. Before we get into that, though, I do need to mention and I need to thank some of our lifetime members. Uh, if you listen to this podcast regularly, you know that Escape Collective is member funded. We are. Well, we're kept alive, we're kept going by those of you out there who have signed up. And our lifetime members, our most dedicated fans, we want to send a special shout out to these folks every single week. So this week, Todd Potter, Claire Law, Glenn Murphy, Stephen Harris, and Dave Munro. Thank you so much for being lifetime members in Escape Collective. We hugely appreciate well, your support, uh, and if you're not already a member, head over to escapecollective.com slash join and join. Please and thank you. So today's episode is going to be a bit, it's going to be a bit different. We're not going to sort of bounce around and talk about the news of of the week. Uh, we'll touch on a couple interesting things, particularly if they're Tour de France related. But like I said, today is going to be, it's going to be a tour route deep dive. So if you want to sort of prep yourself mentally for the coming month, you want to know what's going to be interesting, what stages to definitely tune in for, how we think this race might kind of unfold, uh, and and the, the, the tapestry upon which the race will be painted, we're going to talk all about that. Uh, Dane, I think we decided to go basically stage by stage here, right? So... Before we do that, though, I do want to kind of provide a 10,000-foot a view, a 3,000-meter view uh, of what this tour looks like from afar, right? Like, how does it fit in, kind of contextualize it for me based off of recent Tours de France? What, is it, what does it feel like to you? Uh, I, I've got two kind of major takeaways when looking at this Tour de France route. The first is this is a... Climbers Tour de France, even for 2023. Uh, we, we talk about races these days being climbers or time tower related, and it's all relative. Uh, recently, racing is just far more climber oriented than it was 30 years ago. Even for that, this is a climber friendly Tour de France. There's one TT, it has a climb in it, and everything else is all about the climbs in this race. So I think it's going to be a, a race that... Uh, the riders who are going to try to challenge the, the two big favorites are probably going to appreciate that fact because those two big favorites, you know, Jonas Vingago and Tadej Pogacar, are really good time trialists, and they're just not going to get to use that skill as much. So I'm thinking that, you know, the, the David Godus of the world will be pleased that the climbing is going to be the main focus. The other big takeaway is the fact that unusually for a Grand Tour, uh, we get into the action right away. We don't have to wait for week three. And actually, week three is just, it's, it's just kind of, it's hard, but it's not, it's not like we've seen it the vast majority of other Grand Tours lately where it has all of the action packed into it. There's, it's going to be pretty spread out. The, the hard stages are really spread out throughout this Tour de France. Uh, agreed on both of those counts, Dane. And, and we are about to publish a pretty in-depth sort of route 
preview breakdown thing over on escapecollective.com. And one of the one of the charts I put together uh, when I was when I was making that piece was this I, don't know, I kind of invented uh, my own metric <laughs> a little bit and I charted out each stage and I gave each stage kind of a, a 1 to 10 subjective ranking on how hard it would be for the GC favorites or the other way to think about it is sort of how much jeopardy there was for the GC uh, in that particular stage so you know there's there's a bunch of stages that are up kind of in the nine range those are the ones with lots of big massive climbs uh, if you get a nine it probably has an uphill finish as well or some I think one of them is sort of a pretty scary downhill descent finish um, all the way down to one which is a you know, it's a sprint stage, right? Like, unless something goes horribly wrong and you crash, there's no actual GC jeopardy in those stages. Uh, and the interesting thing for me as I, as I kind of charted this out, and the reason I did it is because everybody's been kind of talking about how this Tour de France is really front-loaded. And, and you mentioned that just now, is that it is kind of unusual that we get into the action as quickly as we do this year. But front-loaded is maybe not really quite the right term. It's, front, it's front-loaded sort of relative to previous tours. But that first week relative to... Well, basically the two thirds of the way through as we get into the Alps is really not, it's not front loaded, right? Like the race is not going to be decided in the first four days. And I feel like a lot of the sort of chatter around this, this tour route has been more in that direction. And that feels, well, it feels wrong to me. It feels a bit disingenuous to me. Yeah. It really just feels like the, the you know, front loaded quote unquote, just means yeah, it's relative. It just means there's actually going to be a chance for GC action in the first week. Uh, p- particularly at the, l- the later half of, the, of that first kind of one third of the race. And if you look back across a, quite a few grand tours recently, that just doesn't happen. We just get sprint stages or, you know, punchy stages where I guess there are chances for GC riders to do stuff, but they never do. I'm looking at these profiles and I think there's a significant chance that we'll actually get to see some battles among the GC riders here. Yeah, and the other interesting thing, once I sort of mapped all this out, and I, again, this, you know, the actual ratings are subjective, and you could probably argue sort of a point or two here and there for a lot of these stages, but th- that doesn't really matter for this <laughs> for this particular exercise. It was more to kind of visualize the difficulty and how it was spread out throughout the, the three weeks, right? And when you do that, it, it's really clear that the tour has, I think quite purposefully, you know, Terry, Thierry Gouvenu, who, who does the, the tour route, he's kind of the head tour route designer, I think this is quite purposeful in that there there really is never more than two days without some kind of GC jeopardy, right? You, you Never more than two days of just sort of pure bunch sprint or something that is almost certainly not going to be a, a GC day. Now, there are a lot of days that are kind of somewhere in between. There's there's days where, you know, you look at them and you're like, all right, that's probably a mostly a breakaway day. Maybe there's a bit of action behind, but, you know, that'll it'll basically entirely depend on whether the racers decide to race as opposed to some of these big massive alpine stages where they're hard enough it doesn't really matter what the racers end up trying to do (laughs) it's it's going to be decisive regardless yeah so an interesting an interesting route from that perspective and not something we have seen at the tour de france in in at least in recent years they're definitely trying to make an effort to i don't know uh tilt the thing toward the modern attention span if that makes any sense like like I said, no more than two stages in a row where we're going to sit there and go, ah, it's just another another sprint stage. Yeah, I think to expand on what you and Dane were both saying, the thing that's that really stands out to me about this route is how distributed the racing is. And I think as far as the, the racers themselves go, that might manifest in two ways, one of which is that for the GC riders, they're really going to be focused on consistency, on not having a bad day. But the flip side of that is that if they do, they're not necessarily out of it. Uh, you know, I don't think this is that that there are definitely going to be guys who uh, fall down the standings pretty far in that before that first rest day. But I think for someone who has like a moderately bad day, there are chances for them to get back into the race. And the way that some of, especially the stages in week two and week three look, there are some chances for kind of bold and aggressive racing that might pay off in a big way. Yeah, I, we'll get to this at the very end of the show, but I do I really want to talk about stage 20 which finishes in Lamarck Stain and, and um it just looks like a it looks like somewhere you'd set a trap basically to me is is what that stage looks like and I I'm, I'm kind of excited about that one if it's if the GC is still close at stage 20 that stage is going to be awesome anyway let's 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 get into it uh we're going to literally start on stage 1 and some of them we're going to breeze right through 
and some of them we're going to spend a little more time on. Uh, but stage one, it turns out, is one that we should probably spend a little bit more time on. So, Dane, talk me through as briefly as briefly as you can stage one of this yeah, year's so Tour de France. The, the race opens, for anyone who doesn't know, the, the Tour de France actually starts uh, in Spain this year, in Bilbao. Uh, it's a Basque country start to the 2023 Tour de France. And Bilbao gets the opening stage. And as anyone who follows racing earlier in the year and watches the Tour of the Basque Country, or who watches San Sebastián, will know there are a lot of punchy little climbs in the Basque Country. And we get a nice uh, uh, inclusion of some punchy climbs right from the get-go in this race. Uh, the first stage of the Tour de France, so often as either a short time trial or a sprint stage, uh, has some pretty tricky little climbs at the end of it. Uh, going to be an interesting one, I think. Going to be really cool. Uh, there's going to be, I think, 10K from the finish. Yeah, 10K from the finish. There is a two-kilometer long climb with an average gradient of 10%, which is really steep. So I'm hoping that we're going to see some some action there. We, we talked a little bit about this the other day, Kaylee. Julian Alaphilippe would be the you know the rider that we might think is the, is the star favorite for this, but... You know, recently we don't really know what to expect from him, so maybe the GC guys will get involved. Well, and we saw a very similar stage won by Jonas Vingago at the Dauphiné this year. And we talked a little bit about that on the podcast at the time and how I think it means that he's he's really put a, a, a heavier focus on stages like that and on climbs like that because this, this Tour de France is full of sort of small moments like that that are not maybe an hour-long climb up the Tourmalet, although that takes them a lot less than an hour. It takes me an hour. Uh and more like, more like seven minutes up one of these, up or ten minutes up one of these kind of steeper things, particularly in the first week. And it, it looks clear that Jonas Vingo has paid attention to that. Granted, you know the Dauphiné field was not what the Tour de France field will be, but he rode away with that stage and he looked extremely, extremely strong in that kind of climb. I mean, left Julian Alphilippe in the dust for one. So yeah, that stage one where let's let's you know remind everybody: the yellow jersey, green jersey, polka dot jersey, white jersey all on the line in that stage. So there is no prologue. There is no opening time trial. This first stage and that climb are going to determine who wears all those jerseys, probably for a day or two at least, although we'll get into stage two, which is also quite difficult. There's a huge amount on the line in, in the, these sort of very difficult roads, punchy roads, difficult climbs. Uh, and I think, it'll, I think it'll be a fascinating, fascinating opening stage. Moving on to... Stage two, uh, from Vittoria Gastias to Saint Sebastien. Uh, I just said that in the in the French version, which is <laughs> this. Actually, I need to go fix it in our preview. We haven't published it yet, so I can still go do this. Uh, but the French put like Saint Sebastian in French, and it took me a second to realize that they had done this to Saint Sebastian. It ends in Saint Sebastian. Uh, another quite difficult run in. Uh, including the Jaiskabel, which is a... Is it Jaiskabel? Jaiskabel? This one's tricky, Kaylee, because it's Jaiskabel in Spanish, but this is Basque country, so I don't I don't actually know what, what the Basque people would say about this. Right. Uh, I don't, yeah. Should we just, like, go English and call it the Jaiskabel or something like that? Well, yeah, Jaiskabel. I'm sure <laughs> nobody will have any problem with us calling it the Jaiskabel. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, the Jaiskabel, uh, which is the... It's, a, it's the final climb in Clásico de San Sebastian, which is a, a sort of very old... Uh, famous one-day race currently placed right after the Tour de France. It uh, seems to be contested primarily by Balcomolema every year. And it's a, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal, interesting climb with a with a pretty tricky descent off the backside. Um, and it's a finale that any any racer who has done San Sebastian in the past will know. Uh, and it always makes for a great one-day, and I think it will also make for a great stage two. The other thing that's worth noting is that at the top of that final climb are bonus seconds. There are extra bonus seconds in this Tour de France. This has been something that's been the case for the last couple of years. I believe it's eight, four, and two second bonuses. Uh, I will go double check that. <laughs> but anyway, there. so there are not only bonus seconds at finishes now, there are also bonus seconds on select climbs kind of near the finish, and the Heiskabel is, is an example of that. 
Yeah, and I think that's, you mentioned that, Kaylee, and that's also the case for stage one, that that last kicker right before the finish line has bonus seconds as well. So I think we're going to see both of those days, we're going to see sort of two finish lines in this race, one at the top of the climbs for the bonus seconds, and then guys trying to stay with the pack, knowing that even if they cross the finish at same time in, you know, 15th place, they might be yellow jersey. Uh, so I think that's going to have a really interesting impact on the racing. Correction, corrections corner uh, already. The time bonuses that are awarded, it's 10, 6, and 4 seconds at the finish lines and 8, 5, and 2 seconds on these special bonus climbs. So, you know, 8 seconds is significant. And if you could, in particular, take a number of them, you could end up with, you know, 30, 40 seconds by the end of the end of the race over your rival. So I think that we are absolutely going to see riders pay attention to those and and go for them. And it should make those finales in stage one and stage two even more interesting. I don't think we're going to see, for example, like Jonas Vingago or Tade Pogacar take yellow in those first two stages. Although I, it, it is, it's of course possible. I would say Pogacar is probably the more likely of the two to just sort of go for it. But I do think that we're going to, we're going to see a fair amount of GC action and probably see at least sort of maybe one or two with a kind of B list, GC stars fall away a little bit already. And I think that's that makes a particularly interesting intro to the race. Could set them up for, you know, breakaways later too, those riders who fall behind. That, that could just be something they're doing kind of semi-intentionally even. Yeah. Joe, let's get on to stage three. Yeah, this is the last stage of the Grand Depart and takes us out of the Basque Country into France. Uh, the starts in Amora Bieta Echiano and takes us basically up the coast uh, to to Spain to or to France to the finish in Bayonne. And this this stage is where the race is finally going to start to calm down a little bit because there are four categorized climbs, including one early that could definitely be kind of a launching pad for an early breakaway. But it really settles down in the second half of the stage, and uh, you know on paper. It looks like a sprint. The big question mark here, I think, is crosswinds. They're going to spend a significant amount of the day on the bay, on the coast. And so depending on the strength and the direction of those crosswinds, that could absolutely change the racing and turn it from being, you know, a chill day into being absolute pandemonium where everybody's trying to stay up front. Everybody's trying to make it into the split. It's interesting. I feel like this is one of the very few stages that actually goes along the coast, I feel like the Tour de France often has stages that, that give us opportunities for crosswinds on the coast. We get a lot of stages in Brittany, a lot of stages in Normandy, you know, the western edge of of, uh, of central France. This year, almost none of that. Uh, and, and that's sort of, this is going to be one of the few days that actually goes along the coast and has that has that opportunity. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we talked a little bit about the sort of the general route earlier, but it is a kind of a weird, it's a weird route. Like we should just say that out loud. It's a weird. It's like unlike anything I yeah. have, have personally covered, and I this will be tour number thirteen for me. Uh, yeah, like it. It it just sort of goes generally northeast for for the entirety of the of the race. It skips the entire northwest of the of the country. It also just like hangs out for a while in two different places. Like we we're gonna hang out in Claremont Ferrand for like four days, and then we're gonna hang out basically in the same sort of like valley of the alps for like four or five days including a rest day so that, that that's very unusual and i mean i don't mind it from a from a covering the race perspective it's a, it's a, going to be a bit less driving for us and a bit less stress around like finding hotels and getting dinner and things like that but uh it is definitely a a it, it is also i should mention this and i don't know if this is purposeful in fact we want to ask the aso this when we get to the when we get to france next week whether sustainability had anything to do with it because i do genuinely think it's going to be a bit less just sort of moving around uh than than previous races like i i when i mapped out a lot of the driving it looked like maybe sort of a thousand maybe even 1500 kilometers less driving than some of the races we've had recently yeah from a tourism driving perspective which is such an important goal of basically every bike race i'm really I mean, there's no french riviera there's there's so little of the atlantic coast after you get out of the basque country uh, it's just really interesting decisions made across the route but i think it does look like a cool route it's just different let's keep going we need to get through all these dax to nagaro stage four whoa this was pretty boring <laughs> yeah sprint stage i shouldn't I say boring yeah. it'll be a sprint stage yeah but you know it's got it's got i shouldn't say it's i actually 
a brief thing about this. It finishes on the Nogaro auto racing track. And the last stage to finish on this particular auto racing track, motor racing track, was in 2017 at Route de Sud. And it was won by Tom Scully. And Tom Scully is not a bunch sprinter, as you all know. Uh, Tom Scully, riding for EF, he's more sort of like a strongman, kind of classics kind of guy. And he actually was in a breakaway of it. I think it was like 10 or 12 riders. And they were caught on the finish line by the peloton. And so Elia Viviani finished like 7th or 8th. I think Brian Cocard was, was right around the same place. Those were the sort of the front of the peloton. My point being here, though, is that motor racing tracks are actually really difficult to mount a chase on. Because they're just full of corners. Like, they're just around a, sort of these sweeping corners all over the place. And they, they're really difficult to to fully get, like... Like, you're not going to get the sort of three, four, five kilometer long straight where a Peloton can go 65k an hour and pull back a breakaway really easily. And so, I actually think that there, this is one of those stages that possibly, possibly, if the sprinter teams leave it too late, they could get caught out. Because, basically, that's exactly what happened last time a bike race came here. Uh, so, it's just something to keep an eye on for this Nagaro stage. Which brings us to stage five. We're not that far into the race yet, and we're going into the Pyrenees. And this is the other reason why people have been talking about the front of this race being front-loaded, or the beginning of this race being front-loaded, is that, one, we've got this sort of tricky stages in, in Basque Country really early, but then we also just get into the Pyrenees, like legit Pyrenees, really, really quickly. So stage five. Joe, walk me through it. Right. Stage five is our first true mountain day. We go, it's 162.7 kilometers and the start is in Po, uh, a, a long time uh, rest stage favorite for the tour. There's three categorized climbs. The uh, the first is the, the Col de Sudet, uh, 15.2K. It's an H, rated as an HC climb, 7.2% uh, average. I think the most interesting part of this, though, is that the, the, the race then sets up to the Col de Marie Blanc, uh, kind of close to the end. It's only about 18 kilometers. The summit's only about 18K from the finish. Um, the descent off that is can be a little tricky in spots, but then you also get a slightly like false flat uphill run to the line in La Rune. So this feels to me very much like a, a breakaway stage. Maybe if, if the Nogaro finish doesn't produce a break, this could be like the first true breakaway stage of the tour. Yeah, and I could see the GC teams kind of hoping actually that a breakaway goes because there are bonus seconds available at the top of the Marie Blanc, and and frankly they don't want any of their competitors to be able to take those. So if the breakaway takes all those seconds, I think all the GC men will be pretty happy with that. I think we should take a brief moment for anybody who is is not as fluent in in tour speak, uh, which I know you know the tour does attract folks who are slightly less fully engaged in the sport of cycling. Brief note on climb categorization. So, or category, which literally means like outside of categorization in French. Uh, that's the highest. That's the biggest, nastiest, most terrible climbs in the Tour de France, all the way down to category four. Uh, category four are sort of like, you know, <laughs> for us, it would be a significant climb. For the Tour de France, they hardly notice it. Uh, unless it's sort of right in the finale of a of a race or of a stage, so that's the that's the scale. Uh, big mountain days are often full of sort of cat ones and cat twos, and maybe one or category one or two or category climbs, uh, and then sort of the, the hailier days are full of these cat threes, cat fours, maybe one cat two. That's kind of how this all splits out. So that stage five, first day in the Pyrenees, followed up by another difficult day in the Pyrenees, a slightly shorter one. Tarb to Cotteret Cambasque uphill finish. This is the first sort of serious uphill finish of the Tour de France, and Cotteret is is a it's a kind of deceptive climb. It's a Category One, uh, and prior to it, the peloton will have tackled the Col de Tourmalet, which is massive. It's an or, or category climb, seventeen kilometers, seventeen point three percent. My guess is we won't see a whole lot of, of action on that tourmalet. Uh, it's just a bit too early in the race. I don't think we're going to see GC riders that want to, to burn up matches on a climb that difficult this early. Not not only this early in the three weeks, but also sort of too far away from the finish line of the actual stage. But we should see some action on the Coterie. I think that that's... that's yeah, it's it's not incredibly steep on average. The average is only five point three percent over fifteen k, uh, but there are a couple 
sections right near the top. There's there's a sort of two kilometer section between kind of kilometer 13 and 14, meaning like you know within a couple kilometers of the finish line that average 10%. So if, if anybody does go, it'll probably be kind of a late move, you know, a Garrett Thomas style move in those final three or four kilometers. Uh, and we could see someone try to try to make a, a jump on that ramp. This is the first stage where I'm really looking for GC riders who have a bad day, like some of the, the B-level GC contenders really falling out. Um, I think, you know, the Tourmalet in particular is such a massive climb. It's an absolute leg softener. Uh, and so once they get to the Calderet climb, uh, as you pointed out, Kaylee, that kick close to the end is the kind of place where if a guy's been sort of faking it and hanging on, there's going to be no hiding when you get to that spot, especially if riders start to attack off the front, which I do expect to happen. We talked about this uh, on another podcast recently where the big question mark for Tadej Pogacar coming into this race is obviously how he's doing after spending a few weeks, well, months at, uh, out of racing. And I think if Jonas Vingago and Jumbo Visma want to be especially ruthless and effective, possibly, they might be aggressive early on in this race if, if Pogacar is trying to build into form. And the fact that he's going to have to go over the tourmalet as sort of like a appetizer for the final climb yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Jumbo Visma is actually pretty aggressive here and tries to take advantage of the of the gradients and, and the possible opportunity that Pogacar is not quite at his very best early on in the race. The Tourmalet this far from the finish feels like a team climb. It feels like where you, if you, if you want to grab hold of the race, you put your whole team up there, you know, yeah. I, I well, we should mention this as well. This is what are one of our little news bits for this week, but so this week... Primoz Roglic announced that he will not be at the Tour de France. Uh, our own Kate Wagner was actually in the room when he did that. Got the got the quotes over to us. Um, yeah, so so Yumbo will be riding these stages without Roglic, which is something that they did not have to do last year. Uh, I don't think that necessarily does a whole lot of damage to them in terms of in terms of like they're still going to be the strongest team in the race. I think. But that's certainly a pretty important... He was a pretty important player in the 2022 Tour de France. You could very much argue that he was you know, <laughs> mostly responsible uh, for setting up the the victory on the Grand Off for, for Jonas Vingigo. So not having him is, is a big deal. And in particular on a stage like this, if they really wanted to push the pace, somebody like that would have been quite helpful. Moving out of the Pyrenees... We're already into stage seven here. We're gonna we're starting to head north. Yeah, we get uh, we get another sprint stage here, and I don't think the profile has all that many challenges on on this stage. I, I'd be pretty surprised if anything all that fascinating happens. Fortunately, it's it's relatively short. It's not a you know two hundred fifty kilometer boring sprint stage. It's only one hundred sixty nine point nine, and the real highlight is the fact that the stage finishes in Bordeaux. Uh, in, in the city of Bordeaux, and technically, I think the the, the finish line is on the left side uh, of the Garonne River, and that is, of course, the, the left bank is where the best uh, Bordeaux wine comes from. And if you want more of that sort of thing, uh, just stay tuned. I'll tell you why the left bank has better uh, better Bordeaux wine in, in the coming days. I look forward to that. I look forward to that. I, I think this, this is going to be, um, what is this? Is this sprint stage number three now? Four? Three. Uh, we're going to be getting into the point now where if Mark Cavendish has not won a stage that the hysteria begins, uh, particularly with our, with our British colleagues, I, I, this is a good opportunity for him. This is a good stage. I think for him, it's a good finale, uh, for him. I'm going to, I'm going to put a little random prediction in, in this very early podcast and say, this is the, this is the home of Mark Cavendish's record breaking tour stage win and you better believe that if i'm right we're going to clip that out and play it again on the tour daily celebrate with some wine oh i will be (laughs) so after our bordeaux finish our mark cavendish stage win we do have a bit more sort of transition here joe what does stage eight look like uh stage eight's an interesting one because like if you look at the profile on paper you'd say oh this is probably gonna be like a a pure sprint finish but uh the the this is uh one of the this is the longest stage in the race so far it's 200.7 kilometers from Libourne to Limoges um but the finish is just slightly uphill so it's not going to be like a really big Mark Cavendish kind of day this is more like the I I think you pointed out in um the the 
ridden race preview that's going to be up on escape soon um this is like classic like peak era peter sagan type finish so those are the kinds of riders that i would be looking for i'd be looking for somebody like michael matthews except for he has also announced that he's not going to be here so i think it's really going to open it up it's going to be a fascinating finish and you could because of the fact that the pure sprinters are maybe not as advantaged on a day like today this could be turning to one of those days it's a little bit of a fight between a breakaway and the the uphill finishers so the yeah the actual finale is 2.8 kilometers at 4.8 percent average and it kind of stair steps a little bit so i i I wonder if someone like caleb ewan could get himself to the finish line you know some of these sprinters who we have seen for example if you could do if you could get over the poggio with something near the front group you're probably the type of rider who if you find form at the right time could get to the finish line on this stage and so yeah matthews i mean obviously like waffen art is the obvious one uh but i do think i I think caleb ewan will probably be looking at this and, and thinking you know if i position myself well and i have good legs i could maybe get there and if i do get there i could maybe win this thing uh but it'll very much depend on on sort of legs on the day, and I would still put his chances of being anywhere near the finish at 50-50. Yeah, I think um, uh, obviously another guy we haven't talked about is Matthew Vanderpool uh, would be an obvious pick for today because for this day because it's not really a Jasper Philipson kind of day. Um, I think Van Aert is interesting to me because there's he's already announced that he will leave the race if he needs to for uh, for uh, the birth of his child, and so it's sort of a an unknown clock ticking on his chances to win stages he's going to want to get them early uh rather than late and it means that he doesn't have the green jersey locked up before the race even begins and so i think there's going to be a fair amount of battling for for every single one of these finishes and probably quite a few of the sort of mid-stage sprint points and this is a perfect example this stage is a perfect example of sprint point comes 79 kilometers in after just a bunch of flat and so we could potentially see sprint teams keeping a breakaway either very small or very close and so potentially overhauling it even ahead of those sprint points to try to get a few more points for their 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 chosen sprinter which brings us up a little bit further north we're now into the Massey central uh so this this tour de france does touch every single one of the five french mountain ranges uh pyrenees alps vosges jura and Massey central and now we're in the Massey central and we are going to be headed to the tallest the highest point in the Massif Central, the the highest mountain, or at least the highest mountain with a road on it, I should say. That's a, that's a point of clarification. Uh, the Puy de Dome, which is a old volcano and also the home of one of the greatest battles in, well, probably the last 50 years of tour history. Uh, it was well, just an, an iconic moment between Raymond Poulidor and Jacques Anquetil and kind of the closest that Poulidor ever came to finally winning <laughs> basically he never won the tour de france and finally beating Jacques Anquetil at the tour he actually dropped Anquetil on the Puy de Dome took a bunch of time back but due to a whole bunch of other things that happened in that race was still was still a bit too far back it is hard these are some of the steepest kilometers of the entire bike race on the Puy de Dome and it kind of sticks up out of the middle of nowhere and has i think two kilometers at 12 percent the average is six seven percent for the for the whole climb it is incredibly incredibly difficult and it's gonna come kind of smack in the middle of a, a pile of otherwise not particularly difficult gc stages so i'm interested to see how the legs kind of respond to well we've had a bunch of days of of kind of sprinty stages the gc riders probably haven't had to do a whole lot they're going to come into the bottom of the Puy de Dome with a relatively large group because the the rest of the stage is Cat 4, Cat 4, Cat 3, not enough to really separate any of the top riders. And then it's basically going to be a, you know, half hour power test, watts per kilo test up the Puy de Dome to the finish line. And, you know, just this is sort of a basic point, but the, the finish is so steep, double digits, that it's it's kind of almost impossible for there not to be some time gaps. It's it's just really hard to like roll across the line within a second of each other when you're when you're going up double digits in the final at five ten fifteen minutes. 
The other thing that I would note about this climb is it's like a classic example of how unusual this year's route is. The last time the Puy de Dome fe featured in any race was the 1988 Tour de France and Tour de France Femme. And so this is a situation where not only do none of the riders in this year's race have any sort of experience or, or, or sort of familiarity with this climb, but there's almost no institutional knowledge of it either. Like even their directors haven't raced this. So I would imagine a number of guys have probably gone to recon it and that will tell them something. But the thing that that doesn't tell them is how it will be raced. And I think that's going to be a really interesting wild card on this stage particularly. Yeah, I'm excited about this one. And I know the tour organizer is quite excited about this one. They, they, I think there were issues with uh, sort of concerns over environmental impact and things like that up there for a long time. And I, for whatever reason, those have been assuaged and, and they are, yeah, they're now prepared to, to go up it once again. Moving on to stage 10. Oh, wait, rest day. I should mention that. We've got a little rest day. Uh, when I mentioned earlier that we're going to be sitting in Claremont for for like five days, <laughs> this is part of the reason why we got a rest day smack in the middle and then a couple more stages that kind of go in and out of, of that city stage 10 though, Volcania, which is right outside Claremont for to Iswar 167 K classic breakaway day. Yeah. You, you got five climbs day after rest day. GC guys are not going to want to be aggressive. Um, it's kind of relentlessly up and down all day. Um, and then there's a sort of a slight downhill to the finish in Iswar. So th this just reads classic breakaway day to me. Agreed. Agreed. Moving on to stage 11. We're still in Claremont Ferrand. In fact, this stage starts in Claremont Ferrand and ends in Moulin. 180K. Dane, this one seems pretty sprinty to me, although there's certainly going to be uh, a, a concerted effort to get a big breakaway move going in that first half half of the profile, which is full of cat fours. Yeah, this feels like a stage where if the sprinters actually really want it to be a sprint stage, it will be a sprint stage. They're just going to have to kind of work together, and that doesn't always happen. <laughs> uh, the route, though, does lend itself to being a sprint stage because by the end of it, things are flat enough that you would think that things will come back together. Stage 12, we're on to Belleville en Beaujolais. This gets a bit more interesting. This one to me has all the markings of uh, like a KOM jersey kind of raid. Uh, because you've got five climbs, including two Category 2s late in the race. Uh, this feels like, uh, to me, a day where, you know, that last climb, uh, the summit is about close to 30K from the finish in Belleville and Beaujolais. And there are bonus seconds at the top of that climb. Um, but I think at this point in the race, those those are start going to start to be maybe a little bit less crucial to the GC contenders. So I can definitely see sort of them those guys sitting back and letting a breakaway go with guys who are focused primarily on the KOM and stage win. Yeah, and it starts basically up a hill. <laughs> like we get into this sort of uh, small rise up to Montigny and then and then a, a category three. Uh, so the the riders that make it into that breakaway are going to be good climbers. There's no question about that. And then they will get to duke it out on these sort of final two cat twos. They will definitely want to use those cat twos to get rid of any of the dead weight in that group. We probably end up, I think, with a, a, a relatively small group. I'm talking one to five riders coming into the finish even though I think the initial breakaway to go off is probably more like in the 15 to 20 range, right? It's going to be, it's be, going to probably be a relatively large group. Another important wine region, by the way. So at the end of the stage, you could celebrate with some Gamay, which is a very underrated grape. If you like your Pinot Noir, you're going to like this, uh, the Beaujolais wine. Again, more, more of that whenever we can talk about it. I'm, I'm going to talk about it. Well, let's get into stage 13 because then we are back into the mountains. Uh, now, this is a, a slightly strange stage. It kind of reminds me of the, the Planche de Bellevue stage last year where it was not a whole lot going on for most of the stage. And then this kind of chaotic, uh, just, yeah, power test again, kind of like Puy de Dome power test to the top of the of the final climb. This is going up Grand Columbia, which is 17.4K at 7.1%. The big thing for me is the last uh, the last couple kilometers, they turn north. So the, the, the bottom of the climb is lots of switchbacks. But the last couple K, they turn north. And the climb also kind of levels out a little bit at that point. The wind is going to have a huge impact on whether riders decide to go or not. 
So basically, if if there's a headwind on that section, if the wind is out of the north, then I could see the GC favorites kind of holding back a little bit because I think that they won't want to be riding that last, those last couple K into a headwind. And if there's a tailwind wind out, of, wind out of the south, then I could think we could see them go for it. So the wind, I think, will play a large role in how this one ends up playing out. I really hope there are multiple GC riders on a single team still in contention by this point in the race because I, I, I like the potential for sort of attacks and counterattacks and attacks and counterattacks by a team that's trying to leverage multiple, you know, a multi-pronged attack on this particular climb because of the sort of the stair-step nature of it. We'll, we'll see if that actually happens. I, I always want that to happen. It very rarely happens, but maybe. You never know. You never know. We should also mention that this is Bastille Day, uh, and so the French riders, in particular Thibaut Pino, is going to want to win this stage. There is no question about that. Uh, for anybody who's watched Unchained, you know that <laughs> you know that he tried to do the same thing on Planche de Belfi last year. Uh, I would say if he does the same thing this year on this particular stage, it would be in error because I don't think he's going to win the power test that's going to be required to, to take this thing. I, I would go after a different stage if I were him, but perhaps David Godou would be looking at this one as, as a sneaky moment to take a stage win if he is uh, indeed still riding at the front of the race. Let's get into stage 14. We're heading deeper into the Alps at this point. Anmas, which is uh, Anmas, which is in right on the Swiss border, uh, heading up into Morzine, and in particular, uh, the descent into Morzine I think is worth mentioning here. This is not an uphill finish. They go over the Jouplan, which is uh, the probably one of the most difficult, like sneaky difficult stages of this entire tour. And then the descent off the backside is really quite technical and fast and uh, has been this exact finish has has seen quite a few uh, Tours de France kind of turned on their head, <laughs> not least of which was 2006 with Floyd Landis. Uh, we could go all the way back to, to that extraterrestrial ride. Uh, some other perhaps fueled performances. We had Marco Pantani take a victory on a, on a very, well, almost identical finish back in 1997. Uh, this is a, this is like an icon. This this particular sort of final 40K is very much an icon of the tour. Richard Varank also did some stuff there, I think. Got yellow jersey. Yep. Fueled by, you know. Just, some, just fueled. Yeah. Yeah. Passion. Fueled by passion. passion. Fueled by passion. Yep. This stage is the, like, if I was one of the, the major GC candidates here, uh, this stage is the trap stage for me. This is where everything can go wrong because you've got, basically, you've got five climbs, including three category ones, and then the, the Jouplan as an HC. And you've got the descent into Morzine, like, all of it just screams, like, the, the, the tension here would be just off the charts for these guys. So this is going to be an absolutely fascinating stage to watch. Whatever happens. Uh, I kind of wish they'd stuck this one on Bastille Day, honestly. But yeah. uh, I do think that the Grand Columbia stage, it'll be, it'll be a good, it will be a good Bastille Day stage. I think they're trying to turn the Grand Columbia into, you know, Alpe d'Huez of 20 years from now, like when, when they have used it a whole bunch, because uh, they have used it a fair amount in the last, last decade. Anyway, that's a separate topic. If we get into stage 15, we are now deep in the Alps and we will kind of stay there for a little bit. Uh, Leger to saint gervais mont uh, Now, I actually, as luck would have it, lived near here for two years uh, and have ridden all these climbs many, many, many times. I'm intrigued to see uh, how much they beat my Col de la Forcla time and uh, Col de Croix free time by on here. I think I've got some times on Strava there. My guess is by at least 50%. <laughs> uh, so I know, that, I know this area really, really, really well, and I think that this... I think that this stage is going to be incredibly, incredibly difficult. Uh, I actually, I highlighted this in the written route preview, but the Col de la Forcla, which comes a fair ways from the finish line, it's at 82K in and 180 kilometer stage. I think that might, depending on how it's raced, that could potentially be a springboard for somebody who really needs to do something. And the reason I say that is one, it's really steep. The top of the side that they're going up is double digits for the last few kilometers. And two, the backside is just this crazy twisty like one lane incredibly narrow incredibly difficult incredibly fast 
descent. And so if somebody does want to, let's let's not call it pull a Landis, let's call it pull a Froom or something like that. Uh, this feels like a stage in which that is potentially possible because it is so, the whole thing is kind of twisty and tight and up and down and up and down and up and down to the point where having a big group is not going to be much help in the latter half of the stage. I think one aspect of the route that really encourages that is that there is almost no time where you're going like down valley in one of those like longer flat sections. So if you are a solo escapee or in a small group, then you really are at an advantage because there's not going to be those times where you're going to be fighting to just keep the gap from closing. You're always going up or downhill and that absolutely privileges that breakaway. Yeah. So I think, one, I think we're likely to see a breakaway in this stage of some sort. Uh, you know, this is the kind of day where if Walt Van Aert is still in the race, if he hasn't left, you see Yumbo stick him in the breakaway, right? Because he could come back to Jonas Vingago, for example. Will he, uh, though? I, that- I don't know. He certainly seemed like a villain to me <laughs> over the course of seven episodes of a Netflix show I just watched. <laughs> but then they, they bring it around. They bring it all back. Eight. They bring it all back. They bring it all back. If you uh, if you want if you haven't already, go go catch our Unchained podcast. Uh, we got we got what eight episodes out. Um, Unchained binge podcast. Search for that wherever you get your podcast, and you'll you'll dig it out. Those were enjoyable to make. Anyway, I think that this is it. This is one of the hardest stages of the race. I actually marked down stage seventeen. We'll get to that in a second as the hardest stage in the race. But I go back and forth between that one and this one. Uh, it is. Like I said, having ridden all of these, not all at once, not in the same day, but having ridden every single one of the climbs on this stage uh, multiple times, it is, it's hard. It's just really, really hard. Quick note about the finishing climb before we move on. If you look at the profile, you'll see it's a cat one finish, 7K at 7.7%, which is pretty hard. But it sort of, it sort of kind of hides the fact that it's actually sort of a stair-step finale with a really, really, really steep lead into that that's actually cat two so the final you know half an hour will be really really hard it's not just the cat one finish it's really just it's it's kind of two sections of really steep climbs separated by a really brief moment of respite yeah and again i'll I'll provide a little bit of uh on the ground insight here the descent in between those two like i can't believe that they don't just consider it one climb to be perfectly honest the the descent in between those two is literally it's going to take them less than two minutes right like it is it's it's narrow and steep and fast, uh, but it's also like over before you even realize that that you've started it. It's really really short, uh, and so effectively this is one climb. And if you add those two together, it's really an HC. Like the the finale of this is really an HC. And as you mentioned there, Dane, the beginning of it, the the Cote d'Amarant is, is I can't remember the exact gradient off the top of my head at the moment, but it's something like fourteen percent for a kilometer or two. So basically, they they're going to come down uh, off the previous descent uh, and come straight into the it's like some of the mo- steepest kilometers of the entire race. Basically, it's like here and the Puy de Dome uh, that are the 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 sort of the nastiest bits, I think. So, anyway, point being, hard hard stage, really hard stage, potential for lots of interesting stuff. Which brings us to the second rest day, uh, July seventeen. We're into a rest day. We're going to get some, you know, do our laundry, uh, hang out a little bit. We're up in the Alps still. And then we kick off the next day, stage 16, with the only time trial of the entire race. And to further annoy all of the time trialists in the bike race, it's got a big old climb in it. <laughs> so even even this one time trial, they couldn't give to anybody who weighs more than like 65 kilos. Yeah, it's a it's a climb that I mean it's only two and a half k, but nine point four average percent. I'm kind of curious to see what you know the the choices are made with the TT bikes and stuff. I mean, this is a steep steep climb to do on a TT bike. I, I have yeah, I've also ridden this climb, and I will say that it is not actually only two point five k. The it keeps climbing for another three k after the top of that 2.5k so i don't really know why they put the top of the climb there it does level out quite a bit so that that first bit's 9.4 percent i think it probably then sits at sort of like four to six percent so you know big ring for these guys and, and tt bike and aero bars my guess is that they run tt bikes throughout on this one i don't think we're going to see bike changes but it is a it's a it's a hard finish it's 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 not a climb to be uh to be scoffed at in the middle of a time trial 
Yeah, I, I was just going to mention the equipment changes aspect. I'm really curious to see what happens there. I, I, I agree. I think most most riders are probably going to stick with their TT bikes just because the the, the stage is pretty short at 22.4k. Uh, doing a bike switch is progressively more of an issue there than it was certainly at something like the the Giro with the Monte Lusari uh, climb or that kind of thing. But I think equipment choices are going to matter a lot, and as is pacing, because as you mentioned, Kaylee, even at the top of that climb, it's not over. There's this like sort of gentle climbing to the finish, and anybody who goes to hard on that climb is going to find themselves in the world of hurt for the last 3k indeed indeed uh you know as time trials go i like this one i think you know we, we've we've had our fair share of debates over time trials there dane uh and i like this one i think it, it the jeopardy is high and so therefore i think it works I'm on Team Kaylee here. I, I find time trial results interesting, but not often time trials themselves. And I think this could be an exception. <laughs> I think it could be good. Kaylee, you have a good. friend uh, in this very apartment. We were watching Tour de France Unchained recently, and my fiance turned to me and said, why do they do time trials? It just seems like they're throwing this <laughs> random thing into the race of just for the one or two days, and then they go back to doing everything else. Why do they even do them? Uh, and I, I had to defend time trials good to question. her as well. Good what did question. you say, Dane? What, what did you I tell said without time trials, then the race would just be for the tiny climber dudes, and you need to balance it out so there's multiple skill sets being rewarded. Unless the time trial is like this. Unless the time trial has a 9% climb. I mean, the reality is it's still going to be... This is one of those TTs where whoever wins the Tour de France probably wins this time trial, right? Because it's going to be this, like it's the straight-up strongest rider that's going to win this time trial. That's the way that it's, it's designed, and... You know, dead flat time trial, maybe Stefan Kung wins or something like that. This is going to be like Pogacar Vigago is going to win this time trial. I, I would put yeah, lots of money on, on that, <laughs> on one of those two things happening, uh, which is, you know, it's kind of fun. Like, I, I, and I would, if they're both still close and they're both still duking it out, they will very much use this as an opportunity to, like, well, you get pretty much guaranteed time gain or time loss in a time trial, right? Because you can't see where the other guy is. So, yeah, it'll be good. It'll be a really good stage. Let's keep moving. Let's keep moving. Stage 17, we are still in the Alps. We're in sense of saint gervais mont blanc to Courchevel. Uh, Courchevel, another sort of classic, classic uh, day in the Alps. Uh, who wants to run me through it? I'll take us through it. you got two early cat ones, which will, you know, cause some fatigue and almost certainly see a breakaway, get some time, I think. Uh, there's the, the Côte de Longuefoy. Sorry to the French. I, Spanish is really more my thing, uh, which is Cat 2 sort of appetizer for the famous Col de la Loz, which is the highest point of this year's race, the Souvenir Henri de Grange, uh, 2,300 meters. Uh, and it's a, it sort of answers the question of, you know, why don't you just combine two climbs into one? Because there is a brief section where they go downhill and then they go back uphill again. So over the course of the whole or category climb, it's, it's 28.1K mostly of climbing. It's not that steep, uh, but it's it's pretty hard. Uh, you would think there's going to be some serious losses for anyone who's not feeling good this day. Well, and the Col de la Lowe's itself is really steep. So, yeah, like the, the sort of the average there is somewhat, um, yeah, somewhat, somewhat disingenuous. Yeah, with the, the in-between <laughs> section kind of brings the average down. Yeah, exactly. It, it, so like, but the last, the last couple kilometers of the Col de la Lowe's, which they go on to like literally a bike path uh it sits at i'm looking at the at the profile right now 9.1 10.9 10.9 9 9.7 percent for those last kilometers and that is a serious serious climb and then it all is also worth noting so they drop down into courchevel the alta port in courchevel and then it actually kicks up to the finish so yes it's a descent into the finish sort of but the very final like 800 meters or so is 18% up to the Alta Port in Courchevel. So just because you have made it over the Col de la Lowe's does not mean that someone's not going to, you know, give it a good kick and take a couple seconds out of you on that little finale. I think this 
stage is the kind of thing where anybody who's showing a little bit of fatigue or even, and I mean mental fatigue, is in potential trouble here because the finish is really tricky. you got the, the Lowe's has a high altitude summit. It's 2,300 meters. Um, and then you've got, like you said, Kelly, you've got this descent to the, the, the final kick up at the Altaport. But I was looking at the finish profile and the way that they get onto the Altaport itself is a little strange. The road actually goes underneath the bottom of the runway and they're actually going to build. So they go through this really short tunnel and then they're going to build a, a ramp basically that gets them onto the runway. And that ramp is literally like a super tight 180 turn. So it, it's almost like <laughs> positioning is going to be an issue. But like, if you're the least bit asleep at the switch, then you're probably going to get gapped off. Yep. Yep. It's going to be a wild finish. I, and like I said, I kind of marked this off as potentially sort of on paper, the hardest stage of the race. Cause we've got two cat ones, a cat two and an or category 165 K part of the reason I did that. And again, I'm, I'm kind of torn between this stage 15 and 13. Part of the reason I did that is the high altitude, uh, sort of, summit at Col de la Lowe's and Lowe's I think is is maybe maybe the strong or the hardest climb in the entire race uh add that to the fact that we're pretty deep into the tour at this point and fatigue is definitely setting in it's, it's been uh you know you just had a, a probably a pretty solid effort and a time trial the day before I think this is potentially potentially the hardest day on paper which gets us into leaving the Alps Stage 18, Moutier to Bourg-en-Bresse, uh, where is a, it's a flat stage. It's going to be one of, well, there's two more opportunities for Mark Cavendish. Three, three more opportunities for Mark Cavendish. This is one of them. We're going to keep it after that. Sprint stage is not a whole lot to talk about. Stage 19, finish in Poligny, 173K, another stage that I would imagine we see a breakaway go away. And very much determined by whether the sprinters want it enough, whether they want to bring it back or not. We've got a cat four early. We've got a cat three kind of 20 something K from the finish, neither of which uh, are too scary. Although, you know, for a pure sprinter, that cat three at the end could potentially do some damage. And then we get to the stage that I'm quite excited about. Now, I'm only excited about this if the race is still tight. Uh, stage 20, Bell four to Lamarck Stain. Uh, this is up in the Vosges, and it's a really hard stage. Cat 2, Cat 2, Cat 2, Cat 3, Cat 1, Cat 1, finish. And part of the reason why I have this one marked off as another potential trap, much like we mentioned earlier, is there's very little valley riding, much like we were talking about on the, on the, on the previous one. Uh, and that makes it really good for some kind of long-distance raid or something like that. And I think that if, for example, if we see a Pogacar off the back of the yellow jersey, I feel like he would be the more likely of the two to just go ham on this particular stage, and it could be really interesting. Yeah, I think, uh, as you mentioned, Kaylee, the lack of valley riding is is an issue. It's also a short stage. It's only 133.5 kilometers. Uh, so obviously that, that makes it more, you know, more likely that somebody will gamble and be aggressive. I think the finish is interesting that the fact that it is not a summit finish also potentially uh, sort of tips it to me to be a, a possible spot for a long distance raid, because I don't think it's the kind of thing where a guy can just attack on the final climb, the, the Col de Platzer Wassel, get a gap and then hold that to the finish. I think it's the kind of thing where he's, you know, you'll want to have the gap going into all of that and basically feel like, like you've got a chance to be able to to hold that over the climb and that the pack will eventually just sort of give up and say, oh, what the hell with it. Yeah, I think the stage goes one of two directions. It's either going to be chaos and we're going to get some long distance attacks and things like that, or it's going to be a real dud because right. of that finish, because of that long, flat, like, you know, d decent amount of distance from the top of Platzervassel, I think. I don't, I'm not really familiar with that particular climb. Uh, they're up near the near the German border there, uh, between the top of that and and Lamarckstein. Uh, it is also worth noting that this is a similar stage to the one where Annemiek van Vleuten uh, basically won the Tour de France Femme last year. Uh, slightly different in that they went over this set of climbs a bit earlier, but it did feature in that stage where she ended up taking what three and a half minutes or something like that on demi volering uh so we've seen that exact sort of long distance raid happen in the last year on a very similar route up in that region 
So there we go. That's the final mountain stage, final real stage of the Tour de France. And from there, we just head to Paris. Uh, starts outside Paris, as always, finishes on the Champs Elysees. And the bike race is over. Uh, of course, the other thing that's happening on that particular Sunday is the Tour de France Femme is beginning down in Clermont Ferrand. What did how much money did Clermont Ferrand give to ASO to get it like we we spend five days there in the men's race and then it's, it's the start of the women's race as well. And I can't say I'm that excited about Clermont Clermont Ferrand is like uh it's where Michelin Michelin is headquartered. It's where it was founded tire tire manufacturer. It has a large soot blackened cathedral. Uh otherwise it is not a particularly interesting place to be in general, sort of by French standards, where there's lots of interesting places. I just don't really, I don't really get this one. Anyway, that was a bit of a tangent. My point being, we will have a big preview of Tour de France Femme as we get a bit closer to that. Uh, we will also have a number of reporters on the ground at Tour de France Femme. So if you are hoping for that material, that is coming, but that race is, well, it's still a month away as opposed to the men's race, which starts bit over a week. Dane, Joe, anything else to add about this uh, this year's tour? I mean, I'm always really looking forward to the tour, but I, I do love this route. I think it's going to be, I think it should be a pretty interesting race. I tend to like more time trial routes, but I think this one, as climbers races go, because it's so, yeah, Joe, you said distributed. It's very well distributed. I, I like that adjective for it, and I think it's going to lead to some really good racing. Thank yeah, you. I would I would say that I, I'm really pleased to see the tour organization take some risks with this route because it is such a kind of a non-traditional route. I'm sure that there will be some grumbling about that, but I think the 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 selection that they've that they picked out is hopefully going to make for a really exciting race and a race that is that stays suspenseful late in the race so that like that that the Mark Stein climb that stage is not a dud where it's just a breakaway thing because I, hopefully the the GC is still up for grabs. Agreed. Agreed. I think it's going to be a good tour. You know, we had one of the best tours in recent memory last year, and the two riders that made it so are back, and I'm very excited about that. We are going to be doing a big contenders preview this weekend on the Pretty Serious Bike Racing Podcast. If you listen to us on our sort of main escape channel, you will obviously get that. If you don't, if you just listen to us on the Placeholders channel, you'll need to head over and dig that one out. That's coming, what, Monday, right, Dane? Yeah, yep. Next Monday. Uh, and that'll go deep, 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 deep on all the contenders and both the yellow jersey and the green jersey and the polka dots and all the rest. We are headed to France pretty soon here. We're going to have a, a large team on the ground, and we will be running daily podcasts from the Tour de France. Now, if you are already subscribed to this channel, you don't have to do anything. You just have to keep listening. They're just going to start showing up. We're going to call them the Tour Dailies, so you'll see that in the title. But, uh, yeah, they're going to start off end of next week once we hit the ground in, in Bilbao. Before we sign off for the day, I have one request. The Tour de France is a big deal for us in bike media. It's a big deal for everybody who loves cycling. Uh, and as you all know, we are a pretty new media company. Like, we're, we're, we're fresh-faced, baby-faced over here. We are, what, three months old, four months old, something like that? Very much in a growth phase, I would say. And what would really help us out, because I know that all of you love what we do, is if you share what we do. Tell your friends who are into the tour about Escape Collective. Send them to the website. Send them to the podcast. Tell them about the tour dailies. Tell them about the Unchained Binge podcast. Word of mouth is our best marketing at this point. And every single person that you share this with is you know, potentially another whole web of of listeners and readers and all the rest. And as you know, we are entirely reliant on those listeners and readers for our continued existence. So share us, please. Leave a leave a uh, review in iTunes or wherever else you listen to your podcast. Leave us a rating and sign up. Head over to escapecollective.com slash join and make sure that you are fully signed up and ready to go before the Tour de France begins. I guarantee you, that, that paywall is going to be uh, a bit frustrating if you hit it in the first week of the tour. So let's get rid of it. Head over to escapecollective.com slash join. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll be back next week from France with, uh, well, it'll be me and Johnny and 
not quite Ian yet, and Ronan in the first week. And then uh, a whole other collection of Escape Collective crew popping in and out throughout the race. So thanks for joining us, and we'll chat next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.